And with us today, we have Adam Jordan. Hey. Tom Webster. Howdy, everyone. And myself, Eric Fine. Uh, once again, I am not the brightest guy when it comes to technology sometimes, so sorry about that <laughs> rough intro. So, Welcome. how's this weekend been going for you guys with a nice long holiday? Oh, it's great. I am Pretty still fantastic. full. <laughs> I'm still full. You know, yesterday I thought I could not eat another bite. This morning I woke up stupidly hungry, so I attacked the Thanksgiving leftovers. I finished all those. I'm like, oh my god, I still want more. Like, I don't know if my inner fat ass came out during <laughs> Thanksgiving, but I just want to eat everything right now. Yeah, That's I, how it's supposed to be. This is the first time I've actually made a pie. You know, I do a lot of cooking. I never make sweets. So made a peanut butter pie, and I did the smart thing. I made Whoa. two. So I had yeah, one. Yeah. Make I a test pie me. and then a backup pie. Exactly. So I've never <laughs> done it. So I made two, and I told Gina, I'm like, listen, we're going to try this before we go. We're going to try it an hour before we leave. That way, if this is garbage, we run to the grocery store and we just buy us a cake. <laughs> there you go. go. That's smart. That's a good way to do it. Uh, so we've all had some time off. You guys did any gaming in on the downtime? A bit. Oh, yeah. Just a bit. Um, I've played exactly one game this week. And it's a game I play every week, so it's not very interesting to talk about. But I've been playing Rocket League. Uh, finally made the grind to Grand Champion, which is gonna, the highest rank in the game. I was going to say, there is definitely something to talk about there. Because yeah. that is Ooh, um, that's a hell of that an accomplishment. Stressful. Yeah, that was stressful. Uh, what uh, is yeah, the percentage it. of players at that rank? It's supposed to be 0.2% after they recalibrated everything. So That's it's, amazing. Yeah. It's it's like the like the global elite of Counter-Strike like that the Rocket League version of that, I guess. But so, it, it's still it's still even within that top rank there's a huge huge like skill gap between the bottom of that and the top of that. So So does this make I'm you a still Rocket nowhere. League stop? No, not at all. So now now when you queue with people, when you queue up for an online game, do you get like the same 10 people constantly? <laughs> no, no, but I do. I mean, you do see a lot of the same. Like I recognize names all the time. Sometimes I queue into people that are on my Steam. That. I know that's a... It's not uh, like the same 10 people. That's more like the, the, the very top end, like the pro players probably. Because they have to wait like 10, 20 minutes for a game a lot of the times. Is Just that, because their MMR is so high, it takes so long to find a decent match. Is that just on ranked, or is that for unranked as well? Um, I think unranked is a little more lenient, but most of those guys don't even play unranked. They just queue up ranked regardless of how well they're playing or what they're doing. I know that ends up being a big problem in Dota, where the very yeah. the very tippy top of MMR, you know, mm -hmm. you get the same you know couple hundred people constantly queuing against one another. Yeah. So that has its own meta. That you know, it sort of trickles down, but because it's such high level play, you know, uh -huh. most average players can't make anything any use of of what the the big guys are throwing down. Yeah, I think in Rocket League, a lot of the pros just like. They queue up and they have to wait forever, so that expands the search and they get into a match with like people who are decent but not at their level, and they just don't get like good close games. Yeah, I yeah. could I could see that being a problem because I know when my MMR got reset, it gets to the point if you're playing with people that are so far below your level, it's not even really fun. It can actually make yeah, you play it's worse. Just frustrating. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I, I, would know, I wouldn't know anything about that. I'm right in the middle of everything. Except in Dota, <laughs> where I'm like I'm like at the very bottom tier, the trash tier, clawing my way up slowly. Dumpster fire tier. Basically. Well, Dota's one of those games you have to play for three years yeah. just to be yeah. bad. Yeah. yeah. Just to be a competent level of bad, you have to play for a couple years. I thought about playing some Dota today, and then I thought, hmm, I could play something else and have fun. <laughs> yeah dota is probably the most toxic community i've ever played in the rocket league man you get some people on rocket league they flame hard yeah i mean i, I know there's a lot of wow higher, and nice save yeah. going on but does anyone really flame to that level on um, the lower on the lower skill levels they do the people that take the game more seriously and have played a lot like i hardly ever run into any toxic teammates and I'm yeah, not even that's like good. top top level, but like 
and the, the higher up you get on the skill bracket, the less of that you see for the most part. And in the lower ranks, it's never at your opponent. It's always at your teammate. Yeah. about how terrible oh, they yeah. are yeah, yeah, even though they're in the same skill tier as you how terrible they are yeah <laughs> i uh i absolutely love that because that happens in every online game so there's a dota podcast i listen to called defense of the patients and if you're into dota check them out they're awesome um but they have started a, a collective work with their members where they go into a game and they tell people hashtag hate the enemy because in Dota, it's such a problem that everyone is infighting on your own team. They all hate each other, and then no one actually cares about winning the game because <laughs> you just hate the people who are on your own team. Yeah. <laughs> you will get to the point where you will resent your teammates so much because of how much of a douche they've been. They'll tell you a good suggestion for an item, but out of spite of how angry they made you, you won't go that build sometimes. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's a big issue. <laughs> and unlike Rocket League, you have a bad teammate, five minutes, you're out. Dota, yeah. you can Dota, have an hour and 20 minute grind. Yeah. Jesus. That was no, I mean, as much as I hate on Dota, I love Dota. And I play and watch a lot of Dota. But I, it's, it's not a fun place to be. I love Dota, but I think Rocket League really took the spot for me because it's smaller, it's more digestible. It's not that time commitment Dota is. I mean, you still have to play a lot to be as good. But it's just one game, five minutes, maybe seven with replays. Yeah, and if if you you know, unlike Dota in Rocket League, if you're having an absolute trash game, you you know you sit there and you stew in that trash game for five minutes. Maybe mm -hmm. maybe if you hit overtime, but in, in if you hit overtime, it's a good game, right? You're at least evenly matched. But mm -hmm. in an absolute, you're getting just wiped. It's ten to nothing. It's totally a dumpster fire. You're out. In Dota, you can know that that game is a complete loss twenty minutes in. And then you have to sit there for the next 40 minutes. Maybe maybe if your teammates can can somehow mount a defense, maybe it goes over an hour where you're just sitting there, you know, battling against the, the waves of time itself. And you know you're going to lose. It's just, it's a painful situation to be in. <laughs> no wonder the community is so toxic. Yeah, I'll, I'll pass on that recently. So, so what been... I've been playing yeah. has not been Dota. I have avoided that Ooh. this week. Um, instead, I uh, I opted for some CS:GO to get my multiplayer on, and I I love CS:GO. I don't play competitively. I'm not even that good. Yeah, you know, I'm usually somewhere near the middle or the lower middle of the of the mm -hmm. leaderboards. Um, but it's fun. I can jump in. I can jump out because I'm playing casual. Mm -hmm. it's just a good time i love demolition mode so demolition mode is different than other modes in csgo instead of having you know the big sprawling map and two bomb sites and buying your weapons it says all right you get these guns you've got a really small map you've got one bomb site in the middle go and everyone just rushes the middle and tries to kill each other <laughs> as fast as possible it ends nice. up being really fast really frantic yeah. matches and uh -huh. you can get in and out done real quick it's nice and clean it's one of the best additions to csgo Nice. Um, other than that, I've been playing a little bit of Spelunky, which I bought on GOG. Um, what do you think? I haven't gotten really far into it. It's interesting, though. I like it. Um, it's definitely slower paced than something like Rogue Legacy, um, which is both a good thing and a bad thing. It's a good thing because if you see an enemy, if you look at the map, you can figure out what you need to do. The bad thing is, is I'm playing it like Rogue Legacy and I keep getting myself killed because I'm not looking before I literally leap. Yeah, you can't go fast. You have to yeah. use your ropes, um, demolish scenery. Have you ever played it, Tom or Adam? No, I haven't. No, um, I've heard good things. I yes. mean, I know a lot of The Binding of Isaac was influenced by that. Yeah, so it's a roguelike with the whole construction layout, enemy placement, blah, blah, blah. But essentially, you're trying to get to the exit of this cave. And you keep going level to level, deeper and deeper and deeper. And as you go, things get harder. Uh, you get to a point where the levels start to get darker so you can't see as much, including your enemies. Mm -hmm. um, but the good thing is, have you gotten to any of these yet, Tom? They have checkpoints in the game. Where you get so far, you have so much money, you could essentially pay for a checkpoint so you can restart there. 
I have not yet. So I'm, I am just beginning. Mm. I probably put maybe two or three hours into it. Okay. Um, but next time you load up, do yourself a favor, attack a shopkeeper once. Oh, I've done that. I actually figured that out by accident. So I didn't see it. I was, I was in like the, this top portion and apparently there was a shop down below it. And I was trying to get, cause there was a bunch of enemies over here and this part of the map. And I didn't want to cross the terrain and try to fight my way through it. So I figured, Oh hell, I've got a bunch of bombs. I'm just going to blast my way down to the exit. So I just kept placing bombs and all of a sudden this word bubble pops up and in all caps it says terrorist and gunshots start ringing out. I'm like, oh my God, what have I done? Apparently I blasted through the shopkeeper's roof and I didn't realize he was a shopkeeper at the time and he killed me very soon thereafter. Oh. Um, so, and I, I did, I found... I was going to buy a shotgun. I'm like, hmm, I don't have to buy this shotgun. So I picked <laughs> it up, I shot the guy, and he died. Uh, and then I didn't know it. I thought, okay, cool. I've cleared this floor. I'm out of here. I'm going to play it legit from now on. No, when that shopkeeper dies, somehow his ghost tells all of his shopkeeper buddies and literally oh, no. every other shopkeeper in the game is out for blood and vengeance. Wow, you and deserve it, though. You totally deserve it. I, I do, I do. I should have just <laughs> totally, bought the damn yeah. gun. You stole but... his shotgun and killed him with it. Yes, yes, I did. But yeah, that is pretty much how everyone I've ever heard of discovers the shopkeeper effect is they're bombing and they don't realize what's happening. And then all of a sudden the shopkeeper yeah. tries to kill them. Yeah. Um, nice. Other than that, uh, I've been working my way slowly through Unreal Gold, the first of the Unreal games. Um, it's good. Uh, it's interesting. It suffers from a lot of the old first-person shooter problems that we kind of got rid of, like enemies randomly popping out of nowhere and, and trying to attack you. Um, you can definitely tell where later games in the Unreal series got... You know, the cool weapons, the terrain design ideas, uh, the enemies. Um, interesting. Uh, the story's not really there. I'm in a mine. I started on a ship. It crashed on a planet. I mean, I guess that was kind of cool. Uh, definitely, uh, in Unreal, they definitely have a flair for the dramatic, though. You can definitely see the, uh, you know, influences on later games, uh, like the Half-Life series, where there's a lot of, you know, show, don't tell. Um, with things you know blowing up or the environments changing or other things like that uh it's it's interesting i'll, I'll have a uh, a bigger report after i finish the game but yeah. so far i don't feel like i'm wasting my time I've, how I've old is that played an unreal tournament game really no oh, i've never oh. even not even once have i ever played one of those so <laughs> um our... do not i am the uninitiated so my school back in when I was in junior high, we transitioned to a new school and it was all mm -hmm. K through 12, everything on the network, really nice. Well, the second to last day of school, a lot of all the seniors are gone. Teachers didn't care. Everyone there was just floating. There was really no exams left. One of my buddies had Unreal tournaments on a flash drive ready to go. We put it on one of the shares and everyone in the computer lab pulled this down. And we started playing Unreal Tournament at nice. school over the LAN. And by the end of the day, we were playing against our teachers on Unreal Tournament on LAN <laughs> over nice. the school network. That's, that's awesome. That's so cool. It was so fun. And since that day, I've always been terrible at them. It's just too uh, fast-paced of a shooter for me. Yeah. So you know how, how Quake kind of dropped off, especially with Quake 4, it was really the death knell of the Quake series until Bethesda inevitably picks that up as well and makes a new one. Um, but Unreal kind of operates in the same vein as Quake, not in the vein of Counter-Strike or Rainbow Six or uh, any of the other more sort of pseudo-tactical shooters. Uh, mm -hmm. Unreal is, hey, there's double jumping, there's wall jumping. Uh, blow everyone up as fast as you can before they blow you up. It's fast-paced, it's frenetic, it's absolutely insane. Um, if you're playing, like, legit Unreal and not one of the other uh, game types, everything is stupid fast. And if you are not using Twitch aiming on your mouse, remove six pixels and you've spun around seven times, <laughs> you are playing Unreal wrong. It is a ton of fun. Uh, and nice. Irk, to answer your question, uh, Unreal came out in 1998. Um, so it was definitely, you know, the same time frame around the original Half-Life. Um, but 
Adam, if you're going to start with Unreal, do not start with Unreal Tournament 3. Uh, it is a black mark on the series. I, all the characters look like they came straight out of Gears of War, and it is slow mm. and clunky. Uh, it's just a bad Unreal game. If you're going to mm. start with one, Unreal Tournament 2004 is probably the best one to jump into, but yeah. Unreal Tournament Classic, or Unreal Tournament 99, UT99 as it's called, uh, is probably the considered the best Unreal game in the series. Hmm. And just to let you know... And they're know, all cheap. No nostalgia associated to it at all. If you get your hands on it for free, go for it. I wouldn't buy them. Yeah. To me, it's not worth a buy. Uh, I don't know. I mean, so you can you can probably find it right now um, to, to transition into a bit of news. Um, there are a bunch of Black Friday sales uh, going on. Um, so you can pick those up for cheap if you're so inclined. But I right. don't think... Uh, I don't think they're hurting for sales at this point on those older games. Uh, but Eric, what have you been playing? Because we probably just skipped right over you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, I've been playing a few different things. You know, you have your standard Rocket League with Adam. But I also last night got into a uh, kind of a party running game. Um, me and a buddy kind of stumbled on called Speed Runners. It's... Um, I don't really know how to explain it. You're running and you're trying to keep people in your wake. You want to, after they fall so far behind, that person dies and you're using turbo and items to keep knocking people back. It's just a 2D loop. You just keep looping. And after someone falls so far back, they die. And once everyone's dead but one person, they get awarded a tick and you keep going. And the first of three ticks wins the race. So hmm. it's like this constant... Um, battle race i guess you can call it yeah where there's always multiple paths you can take for shortcuts and stuff and there's catch-up mechanisms built into it where the person in front if he hits two switches on the he hits the first switch it'll close that path no one else can get there if he hits the next switch before anyone else hits the one on the row underneath him it opens up a special thing that gives boost to everyone that's coming far behind interesting as long as they hit that so it builds in catch up. It's not the Mario Kart. Oh, we're actually going to make you a little faster. It's actually we're going to open up parts of the course for you to pick up boost and items. So it's pretty, pretty interesting. Cool. Yeah, um, I, I saw the the trailer for that. Do you think it has any staying power? Because I I thought that it looked interesting, but I don't know if it's going to have a community after six months. It's a party game. I yeah, mean, this, the it game in itself like came out game. in April. It's um. It's similar to like a Mario Party. You're going to play it when friends want, but it's not yeah. something you're going to sit on your couch alone and play. Okay. Or like Battle Block Theater. That's not a game I, I enjoyed playing that. alone. You, yeah. You read my mind. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I um, need to play that again soon. When was that? About two years ago um, at my apartment, we all started throwing down on that. Um, yeah, that sounds so. about right. Yeah. With all those different variants. A couple but, of rib fests ago. Yeah. Ah, oh, the great rib fest days. <laughs> But um, outside of speedrunners, um, I finished The Witness. Finished. Finished. I did not well 100%, finished. but I ended the game. Um, and good and lord. Story? Dumb. <sighs> or not story, but... So, I believe, personally, myself, I believe there is a theme to the game. Mm -hmm. um, I'm not about to say what it is right now. Yeah, don't. But some of the <laughs> statues to me kind of hinted at it. Um, yeah. But I think there is totally a story at, to it. Maybe at some point we'll just do, uh, when both you guys finish it, we'll do a little spoiler cast, kind of debate on what we think of it. But mm -hmm. I recommend it to anyone. Really, really, really good. If a certain type of puzzle gets you stomped and you know you'll never be able to get past them, you don't have to solve to beat the game. There's only You only have to solve seven of 11 types to be able to get to end game. Oh, that's, so that's my favorite part about the witness is not yeah. being, yeah, you know, there's, there's never a hard wall. There's yeah. always walk away and try something else. Yeah. Okay. That's good to know. And it's, this game's beautiful to the point where I'm just not graphically, but you're going to get to the point where you think, yes, I did it. I'm there. Oh wait, there's more. And that it just like you, you stop because <laughs> you realize what's happening. But yes, yeah. um, everyone should play that. It's really good. Um, I picked up Tabletop Simulator on the Steam sale because I like tabletop games. 
Um, they have a ton of different preloaded games, checkers, chess, blah, blah, blah. The community has board games like Monopoly, Sorry, Trouble, Chinese Checkers, all that stuff. But the fun thing is the community also has D&D packs where it gives you the dice, it gives you figurines to use, it gives you terrain maps to use. Really useful to the point where I picked up a four pack and I plan on sharing them out so we can do D&D nights and stuff like that. Ooh, with people because nice. i just it's a really good game interesting to look at if you're into tabletops this sounds like it could be cool. a streamable experience Ooh, it does potentially and um <laughs> the good thing is if someone is an asshole and hits that flip table button that we've all seen hundreds of times there is a back button that can rewind it immediately back to where it was Oh, yes. well, nice. I can flip the table. So when Tom We're going to be flipping so many tables. When Tom Ooh. tries to rage, I can hit the back. Table button. flip stream. Yes. Let's let's do it. The stream of flipping tables. Yes. And then probably what I sunk the most in time into outside of Rocket League is the new Pokemon. Ooh, so how are, how is it? I pre-ordered on Amazon like I said last week, showed up on time. There is no gyms. That is not a spoiler. That has been well documented at this point. Yeah. The replacement for gyms is done very well. You will still feel the push of a gym without a gym. Uh, there's, okay. Okay. there's more boxes to check, but it still gives you like this kind of drive and actually adds a little bit of variety to it, which is some of it's really corny, but it's still really like refreshing. Nice. That's good. They're still able to put, make changes and put new things in without enraging everybody and making the gameplay suck yeah i i heard a a rumor that the pokemon universe as far as the games go was going to undergo a massive reset after this game but that's just a rumor at this point i have no inside information so Mm -hmm. i could i could the way the story because okay i i have to say this i love the reset on the gyms great this pokemon is the most story focused one i've ever played and hmm. let's put it this way. Hey, Tom, what's the story to Pokemon? Well, there was a bunch of ancient Pokemon, and some of them created the universe, and then others created certain parts of the universe, and then there's the whole thing with the unknown. And then in the first game, you've got the genetic okay, experiment let me with stop Mewtwo you. and Mewtwo. <laughs> okay, let me stop. What is the majority of players' purpose in Pokemon? What do they care about? you got to okay, catch them all. Yeah, Thank you got to catch them all. And all you have to be... You have to top the elite four. Yeah, you have to be the best, that's the very best. Though. Like no, no one, one ever, ever was. was. Yes. To catch them's your real quest, damn it. But um, yes. train them is your cause. Train, but um, no one cares about the story. Is what it comes down to. Pokemon. I mean, that's something they had to have known by now. They grind yeah. out like a JRPG, and you collect every tick you can. There was so much dialogue at the beginning of this game. For the first hour and a half, I think I was stuck in about 45 minutes of dialogue. Whoa. It Ow. was painful. Huh. Like, this was the first time I thought to myself, just shut the fuck up and let me get to where I want to go. It was you really You really don't see that. In Kojima Productions presents yeah, the I new know. Pokemon <laughs> movie. <laughs> it was like, Metal Gear Solid brings you Pokemon. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> It was bad. It was really bad. But the gameplay's really good. The game How are the Pokemon? Um, like, the I'm, st- I'm guilty of, I'm sure a lot of us nostalgic. The original 151, yeah. I thought were cooler. And some of the newer ones they kept coming out with really lame looking or really dumb. But Agreed. Yeah. They, they did. it's a new generation? So this generation is doing really well so far. They have some really cool looking ones. Out of the starters, you have a cat that's fire. You have an owl that's grass with like a little cool grass bow tie. And then uh, you have this weird looking seal dog. No one wants a seal Seal dog. dog. It's a seal dog. Yeah. I think um, the owl's a seal dog. As they evolve, I don't know about the seal dog. The owl looks really cool. Hmm. um, The fire cat turns into like this wrestler. But Hmm. um, a lot of the Pokemon are really cool looking. They actually mix in some realism. But they also kind of still keep it flourish. Hmm. I appreciate it. Nice. Uh, one gripe is they also make it too easy. They've gotten oh, the habit of yeah. uh, giving share all at the very beginning. Oh. So you turn that on and you just grind through the game. Yeah. You never get touched. 
I mean, that's that's the thing that really held you back in early Pokemon games is until you got Share All, you would have to individually grind your Pokemon up. You would have to do the switch. You would start with your weakest, switch out to the strongest, yep. kill. Yeah. Hmm. But yeah, so that's that's been the bulk of my afternoons recently. Every night before I go to bed, I grab the 3DS and um, it's Pokemon. Nice. It's been going pretty well. So we've got, it's it's been, because we're approaching big holidays, it's been very light on news recently. We do have a couple things that we want to cover. Uh, as I said before, everyone and their mother is having a sale. So, you know, your local retailers, uh, Steam is having a big sale. GOG is having a big sale. I haven't checked Humble. I'm sure Humble's having a big sale. Um, so if there are games you want or games in your backlog, go check out your wish Start list. Yeah, check out some prices. Um, I, I personally, I bought the new Doom game for 20 bucks today on Steam. Um, mm-hmm. I have not played a moment of it. So uh, we'll probably be streaming that at some point this weekend if you would like to check it out. Um, also... In the realm of sales, uh, if you are looking at an HTC Vive, the you know granddaddy of VR, the thing you, sh- if you're serious about VR, you should be buying right now. I swear to God, it's the best thing you will buy. Um, it's a hundred bucks off. So if you have the means and the computer, go get it because the Vive is just fucking awesome. <laughs> and on the game front, um, holidays are coming up. Steam has this wonderful thing with a lot of the games on there that do four-pack bundles because playing yeah. alone sucks. So go yeah. ahead, pick you up a four-pack bundle, and there are some really easy Christmas presidents or presents? Presidents. That Christmas are, presidents. You give them George W. Bush for Christmas. Well, hello. <laughs> <laughs> but it's a nice loaded present because you gave them a gift. And the best thing is you get them to play the game you want them to play. <laughs> it works out. <laughs> yeah. You can guilt them into your multiplayer experiences. It works really well, trust me. Risk of rain. <laughs> yeah, but that was worth it. Yes, that game's fantastic. It was. So, uh, Eric, I believe you heard something about Hello Games. And for those of you not in the know, Hello Games is the uh, developer behind a, uh, a very controversial space game that came out recently. So, no Man's Sky. Yes. So Hello Games has been off the radar. Outside of a rogue tweet stating that um, that it was a mistake, um, they have been dead silent. And finally today, they released an inf- some information. They are releasing a new update. Uh, they're calling it, I think it was the foundation update, because they believe this is going to be the foundation of the game going forward. As well as it is implementing uh, base building, which... Hmm. I've already had some talks with people who had the game, put some time in the game. It's up in the air how they feel. Yeah. Um, base building is definitely a solitary thing. You set up a base, you stay there. So far, the feel of the game has been you jump to this planet, see what's there, jump to the next planet, see what's there, jump to the next planet, see what's there. Yeah. And there is no means of going back. It doesn't show you where you've been. Oh. Oh, that's painful. So why would you want to build a base if it's if you're just exploring openly throughout space? And that's where a lot of issues come up is the questioning of, are they going to put a system in that allows you to easily go back? What is this yeah. base building actually going like to be? Map or quick travel thing. I haven't played the game. Um, I know a lot of it's collecting resources, right? Yeah, it's... Collect- do, do they give you enough, like, is there enough in the game before this update to use those resources and spend them on things? No, most of these resources, so, there's no purpose. Okay. So the base building probably then will help incorporate those resources a little better so that it's actually worth it to go get them. And that's how I felt about it. Um, yeah. It's just to what end? Because right now it would be base building for the sake of base building. Yeah. The AI is not intelligent enough to where it's going to seek and destroy a base. There is no NPCs of intelligence like uh, aliens that are going to be attacking. Yeah. And this game has came under fire for not actually having multiplayer. There has been documented cases where people have been at the same planet at the same spot and they don't see each other. Hmm. Because that's a problem because that was something they mentioned. 
early oh, on. This entire yeah, well, well, they things. also mentioned. Yeah. What was it like that technically, if you found the same planet, you could see another player, but the, the the universe is so big and vast that the odds of that happening are basically none. Yes. So that's how they worded it. So they worded it actually including that there, you would be able to see them, just odds are never happen. Right. Where within my second day, I stumbled upon a planet someone else has discovered. Mm. It doesn't happen often. I've only had it happen yeah. three times, I think, in the 60 hours I played. Right. But um, it's it may be like Tom was bringing up earlier, too little, too late, possibly. Yeah. You know, I've, I've got a question, and I'm trying to remain spoiler free for those of you who are still interested in playing No Man's Sky. But so if, if you build if you build a base and you hit the next part of the game, if you know what I mean, um, is there any way to go back to the previous part you were at? You'd I don't have... think there is. Um. I'm trying to remember. It, it throws you to, and then you gotta, and then there's <laughs> really trying to avoid spoilers, but you know what I mean, right? There's no way to go back. In my, if I remember right, it's an eight bit unsigned integer for the number of things. So yes. you would have to do it, um, 256 times to get back yeah. to be able to. Do... <laughs> no one's going to do that. I, ah, oh, I'm the sure they'll, they'll of, make it work I, I, somehow. I wish No Man's Sky had like four more years of development time because it would have yeah. been one of the greatest games of all time. But thank you, Sony. You fucked it for all of us. So me and a buddy <laughs> constantly talked about this. It's I, I fully look at it at this point. What's happened's happened. You can't hold future enhancements against what was said earlier. I yeah. bought a $60 pre or um, early access game. That's how I'm viewing it going forward. Yeah. Yeah. There's really good premise right now. Ignore the story. If you buy the game, ignore the story. There is little to none, and it's not worth doing anything with. Mm -hmm. uh, but it's enough for that for today, because that'll drone on for some some time. <laughs> uh, we do have um, some some nice uh, some nice rumors coming out of Nintendo, uh, where they have filed a patent claim. Um, or a, uh, I'm sorry, not trademark. Patent, a trademark claim in Japan for Wave Race. Now, this doesn't necessarily mean anything before all of you go out and pre-order the Nintendo Switch. Um, Nintendo files trademarks for several, several, several things. Um, you know, uh, some stuff that has happened and a whole lot more that has never happened. Trademarks yeah. are just a way of saying, hey... We're going to put this out there just to establish our legal boundaries around the idea because we may or may not be doing anything with it. Right. That said, wave race. Yeah, I'm giddy. <laughs> I am giddy with excitement. I remember um, vividly as a kid sitting in the basement, there was two games that I would play. Me and my neighbor would play back and forth constantly. It was GoldenEye and it was Wave Race 64. Oh, Wave Race 64. I didn't have either of the games, so I had to walk downtown to my other buddy's house and borrow the game, come back home, play it, and then give it back to him the next day. So Wave Race 64 was probably one of the, if not the technical crowning achievement of the Nintendo 64 as a gaming platform. It was stunningly beautiful for the time. I mean, you go back and look at it now, you're just like, really? that thing but you had 3d water physics if you can even call them that because they weren't really physics but they kind of were um it in any case it was a fun game and very technically impressive for the time um wave race hasn't had the biggest following it's really a niche title uh amongst nintendo faithfuls but uh yeah i i, I would like to see another one just to see it and for those of you who are completely unfamiliar, Wave Race is a racing game, as it sounds, with um, jet skis. And there's these ramps that you can do flips through or flips off of into these rings to get bonus points and stuff. It was it was a good time. Good time in my childhood. Yeah, it's a good <laughs> game. So that's about it for the news. I imagine everything is going to get even slower as time goes on, uh, just yep. because of the big holidays coming up. Um, but we did have two 
group topics to go through tonight. Uh, the first of which being, what are the best games to play with people? And we're going to focus mostly on in-person games. Like you're you're going over to you know your cousin's place. What are you bringing? to the Thanksgiving dinner table to play with your family members. And hopefully on the table, right beside the damn turkey. Oh yeah, it's gotta be <laughs> right there. It's front and center. This is why you came to Thanksgiving. We'll let Adam start on this one. So, yeah, some of my some of my best in-person gaming experiences, and Eric, you'll definitely relate to this one, was Halo. And it was mostly when I was a kid, when I was still in school. But going over to a friend's house, hooking up four controllers to the thing playing halo oh it's it's just so much fun i remember one specific moment that you were telling me about where who were you playing with was it patrick no it was um it was uh, another buddy back in bradford uh okay well you can tell the story better than i can yeah so we we did halo right we didn't do four people on one console we did 16 land parties with multiple boxes Nice. So, uh, me and one of my other friends were really, really good at Halo 2 at this time. I mean, we were stupid good. So, um, they wanted to go um, everyone versus us. So, we wouldn't have screen watchers. We made it 2 versus 12 on the uh, Blood Gulch remake. We did snipers. We ended up winning the match. It was something like 50 to 12. But at one oh. point, one of the kids in the other room just starts yelling, they're everywhere. <laughs> and that was the most... They're everywhere! It was one of the most beautiful moments of Halo for me. But yeah. Halo was just so much fun with friends. I had so many good memories with that. At one point, we had two TVs with two Xboxes set up, dedicated for it in my basement. And um, I remember... Uh, a couple of buddies coming over before school and we would system link before school. Cause we, you know, I, those. as much as I love, you know, the internet and online gaming and being able to jump in any game with anyone at any time, there's just something missing. You know, I love system links and I love local multiplayer and I hate that I don't get to do it as often as I did when I was a kid. So, yeah. When you're a kid, that's, that's the only type of multiplayer is guys on the same console. Mm-hmm. Well, especially then, because network play didn't get integ- I mean, didn't really popularly get integrated until Dreamcast PS2. Yeah, I mean, there yeah. was some really crappy things for like the SNES, but I mean, the real multiplayer didn't start then, and then it really didn't get legit until Xbox Live. Yeah. yeah. So one of mine, I've I've got two in particular. I'm going to lead off with the biggest one though. Um, when I was a kid. I had a uh, a battery and a snap-on screen to my Nintendo GameCube. And I had four WaveBirds. And I had a backpack that contained this monstrosity. So literally anywhere <laughs> I went, I had an hour and a half of GameCube power. Um, it was beautiful. So I decided, I'm just going to bring this thing to Thanksgiving. Now, I did pack in the AC plug just, just to have it. Um, And me and my cousins uh, went over to my aunt's place and we played Super Smash Brothers Melee the entire day. And in Melee, it allowed you to do bracketed tournaments. So we would do these these crazy, huge bracketed tournaments with like mostly PC players and then four humans scattered throughout the tourney. And we figured out who was the best cousin at Super Smash Brothers. And, you know, spoiler, you can skip the next like three seconds if you don't want it. It was me. I totally. It. <laughs> it was great. Big surprise there. Yes, yeah, Smash. Uh, yeah, Super Smash Brothers. Nintendo found a way to pink, bring people together for local play. I think the yeah. first game that I had from them like that was definitely Mario Party Three. I kind of skipped on the first two, but Mario Party Three was definitely one of those. Get four people together, jump on the sixty-four, play some Mario Party. Mm-hmm. Did you you did you never have like giant Mario Kart battles, Mario Kart sixty four? Um, I never really had the giant ones. We always had like three people, and that was it. We didn't really ever have a room full of people doing kart. Okay, I I remember we had I loved battle mode in Mario Kart sixty four, and and I would regularly have you know four players on a screen uh, going at it. It was 
it was a lot of fun. Now the N64 didn't ever have the ability to do system link stuff. So, you know, four players was your max, but you know, e even still Mario Kart is one of my favorite multiplayer games of all time. And we we can throw in Goldeneye there too, just as a yeah. well, of course, yeah, everybody bonus. played that. I didn't even own an N sixty four, and I still played Goldeneye with friends. <laughs> so you didn't have a sixty four, Adam? That no, you, that... I, I went straight. I went straight from the Genesis to the PlayStation, and then straight from that to, uh, I guess, PlayStation two or Dreamcast. So it must have been Dreamcast. The main thing for me was sixty four was your party system. That yeah. was a big bring everyone together. So how did you just party system with other people at other places? Yeah, just going over to friends' houses that had the N64. It was mostly that. But um, but yeah, Nintendo's always done a great job at that, even in more recent, like the Wii. The Wii. Yeah. Um, us going over to Tom's oh, place and playing uh, Super Mario Striker. That was so fun. That oh was my God, so Strikers. much fun. Striker's a and blast. You, you never... I don't know if it's just like the types of gamers that those developers are targeting, but you don't mm. see the big multiplayer, you know, same room multiplayer games yeah. on the Xbox or, or PlayStation platforms. It's always yeah. the Nintendo console that gets everyone in a room. Right. Well, I'm going to correct you right there because there's one more I was going to bring up. <laughs> oh, go ahead. What is it? Castle Crashers. That yeah. is a oh, in the same yeah. room experience. Of It's a really good one. It doesn't yeah. pull the party like the other ones do, but you get four mm -hmm. guys together or gals and you're um, just smashing on the buttons on that game. It is really fun, mm -hmm. especially the first go around because that story is goofy. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, Castle Crash, this is great. Mm -hmm. And the unlockables, because you could play that game. We played that for months and still never unlocked all the content. Oh, that's crazy. Um, the uh, the last one I would like to mention is a retro title, but definitely one of my favorites in bringing people into the room and then blowing them up in the most violent ways imaginable. <laughs> yes, I am referring to Mega Bomberman, one of the best multiplayer games of all time because it's it's got a little bit of you know tactile skill. You can't like be dead on the controller, but it's mostly a game of mind against mind, trying to trap and outwit and outsmart your opponents to make them make just the slightest mistake with their bomb placement, and then boom, blow them all over the battlefield. Was that you saying you're really bad? No, I'm actually, I'm really good at Bomberman. <laughs> I am fantastic at Bomberman. Um, it's, it's one of the multiplayer games I have put the most hours into. We... I played it on the Genesis mostly with Mega Bomberman, but um, it exists on virtually every platform out there. Uh, mm -hmm. But the Genesis, without the multi-tap accessory, only had two controller ports. So what we would do is, you know, with multiple people in a room, we would trade off on deaths. So if I died, you know, I would hand it to the next person who hadn't, you know, played recently. Mm -hmm. And uh, we, we structured our tournaments like that. Uh, but Mega Bomberman is definitely one of my favorite games mm -hmm. of all time yeah pass the sticks god i remember oh, yeah. that in college <laughs> in college we had a modded xbox in the community room and uh we was able to run like uh, an actual four players on a lot of games people generally couldn't because the nes and sega like you said tom required multi-taps yeah so we would run four player rc pro am 2 nice. and we're talking seven to eight guys all in 20 years old in a room playing an eight bit racing game for hours. Hey, Granted, we was all engineers, but with RC pro am. All right. RC pro am <laughs> is the shit. Even to this day. Did you have any other ones that you always played as a kid, Adam, or was that pretty much um, the run? Um, you know, su surprisingly, I think even some, more single player games like i i miss sitting down on a couch with you know a couple of people and just passing the controller through turns of a game even if it's single player um i played a lot of tony hawk's pro skater when i was younger and yes. we would have a lot of fun just you know go one run through the level you know maybe collect skate or find the hidden tape or whatever and then okay pass the controller over the next person goes and they find you know the spell out horse or whatever and they you know they get some of the other challenges that was just so much fun i miss games where you could just sit sit in a room and pass the controller back and forth through through runs or turns of a game 
The most recent game I can think to, that I've done that with was Super Meat Boy. Uh, oh, me, and, yeah. me and a couple of buddies sitting and passing the Xbox controller around trying to get through <laughs> any part of Super Meat Boy because that right. game is brutal. You well, you would to have to that. have you'd have to have multiple turns of that though. Yeah. If you pass through every death, you'd be spending more time handing controllers over than playing the game. <laughs> yeah, and also the reason to pass that off so you don't break the controller because how furious you get at that game. Oh mm -hmm. my god. I love Super Meat Boy, but it is so infuriating. Yeah. So, that's that's it with that one. Um, to do the most best transition of all time. Um, so, <laughs> for, for our next topic... Um, and I, I think our podcast is going to run a little bit over, uh, uh, who but, cares? but this is such a good topic. Um, if any game company, like developer, publisher, whatever, if any game company could own any franchise or IP, who would you want it to be? We're talking like if, if Naughty Dog could own Mario Brothers or oh. if, you know, we could give, uh, you know, almost said konami metal gear solid but we've yeah we did <laughs> yeah we, we did we get it <laughs> yeah 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 so i'm gonna pass this off to adam first who what well, series oh. what franchise would you like to give to which developer and how would that look um well i'd like to give the silent hill franchise to the kojima productions but well i guess we can't do that <laughs> that would be amazing no Spend but for real that would have been such that would have been such a good one but um i want to see and I don't know which one, either Naughty Dog or the CD Projekt Red, the makers of The Witcher. I want to see them make a hyper-realistic, adult-oriented, gritty, violent Pokemon open-world game. Yes. Oh. Holy shit. Holy and shit. I, and I want those Pokemon to bleed when they get hit. I want to see... I want Haunter to be terrifying. I want the dragons to be super cool and badass. I want them to take the kid out of Pokemon and make cater to the cater to the twenty some year old audience that played Red. Make red Pokemon and blue. the dog fighting game that it really yes. is. Yes. I have never <laughs> wanted something more in my entire life. <laughs> that's what I want to happen. Well, and that's awesome because that's actually something where just make it more realistic. You're not even ha don't have yeah. to change the storyline. No, no, the story could be exactly the same. But just cha change the mood, change the violence, change the realism. Oh, that would be brutal. That would be beautiful. And, and, and you know, CD Projekt Red has a lot of experience with open world games. I haven't played through all the Witcher games, but like, those are big, beautiful, thriving open worlds. So here's my question. Like, actually, I was thinking about this a little today. Um, what mm -hmm. happens in when you run across a Pokemon? Then are the humans now likely to get attacked? I mean, do you uh, have to be careful maybe. of a Charizard on the mountain that's just going to fly down and char your ass? Maybe, maybe not. God, that'd be God, that'd be so good. You maybe there would be parts monsters. where you have to run away from some, and you know, it's some Monster Hunter in there too. Yeah, that's that's basically yeah, kind of something like that. Oh, uh -huh, so you yeah. could actually you could weaken the Pokemon yourself by fighting it. Yeah. Oh, dude. Something like that could be cool. So, so I'm I'm gonna throw this to Eric because because mine are, are just goofy. So, what what would you <laughs> like to see? A, I would like uh, to see. Um, take over? I think I would like to see Bungie take over Halo. Oh just... wow! <laughs> Wait oh, a minute. minute. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you. But no, no. I mean, I am joking, but I am being honest. Three, four, three hasn't done terrible, but God, Reach was the last really good installment to that. But yeah. um, I think that someone like Gearbox taking on Resident Evil, you would have this hmm. game, this company that's known for making really good games, um, and they can do it in some really dirty feeling environments while making them feeling goofy, silly, and just lighthearted. Where yeah. Resident Evil has always had this dark survival tone to it. I think it'd be fun to get these zombies more cart uh, more cartoon based. And just play around with it. Just have fun with hmm. that whole... That that could be interesting. Well, one of the Borderlands DLCs, I think, had zombies in it. I mean, it wouldn't play the same at all, but that could be cool to see. I'd like to see Resident Evil cell shaded Exactly. It would be <laughs> gorgeous. And especially if it's not really dark. If it's act they actually yeah. brighten it up. 
Oh, yeah. That could be cool. Hmm. Yeah, I'd like to see that. I think that one would be the fun one for me. Well, I've, I've got a jokey answer for, for my first one. Um, and then I've got a, a more a more serious answer, but it's going to require some quantum mechanics and time travel to pull oh, off. Oh, no. Okay. Um, so, okay, the first jokey answer is I would like to see Rockstar Games take over Super Mario Brothers. Just imagine how that would look. If you hmm. could play Super Mario Brothers into the hands of Rockstar, what would they do with it? Would they stay true to the series intention would they make something completely off the wall knowing rockstar though whatever they make is going to be one of the highest quality games you have ever played so would mario be riding a yoshi shooting down birdos or would he be driving a go a go-kart around shooting up toads you know i don't know and i i think that's kind of it's it's goofy it's goofy as all hell to think about but it would be really interesting to see what Rockstar would do with that IP. My mm-hmm. my real answer though would I I would like to see Silent Hill made by Ultra Games. Um, now, for those of of you who are time travelers or gaming historians out there, uh, Ultra Games is what Konami called themselves before they became Konami. I would like to give all of Konami's franchises to Konami from thirty years ago, huh? Instead of the Konami of today. Yeah, it's 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 a really sad answer because now we're getting Silent Hill Pachinko and and God knows what else. But but I really I Konami was one of the biggest best powerhouses in the gaming industry for a very mm-hmm. long time. They made you know some of the most amazing franchises staples of the mm-hmm. industry. I, I mean, Metal Gear Solid changed everything about the stealth action genre. Um, you know, you look at Silent Hill. Silent Hill. It changed virtually everything about the horror genre at the time where Resident Evil was king with, you know, jump scares and generally dreadful environments. Silent Hill said, no, we're going to attack your brain. This is going to be full on psychological. (laughs) It was utterly terrifying in a completely different way. Mm -hmm. But I I really want old Konami back. Yeah. I'd also like to see something like Age of Empires if you used to put them under Blizzard. Because Blizzard knows how to make things really pretty and does have experience with, I mean, honestly, Warcraft was an RTS. Yeah. So Mm. actually, you'd get a revamp on that, make it really super pretty, get the Blizzard touch to it while having that really, really um, cool progressive um, RTS, like um, Civ-based, only it's RTS instead of turn-based. Yeah. Mm, That could be cool. That would be cool. So I, another thing I was I was thinking about is, you know, because I've I've been thinking a lot about with all the news of the Switch and and looking at my old Nintendo catalog, they're you know, just kind of <laughs> staring at it over there, remembering the good old days. I would like to see Bethesda take the Legend of Zelda. I want to see a Skyrim esque Zelda game. Um, Holy just crap. newsflash: I think you are going to. <laughs> I, I hope so. I mean, that's what Breath of the Wild is trying to be, right? But I yeah. don't know if they can do it justice. I, yeah. I've been watching old videos of Majora's Mask and listening to Majora's Mask re, uh, remixes and stuff. And that's kind of what made me think of you know Zelda in a really dark tone. Because Majora's Mask was by far the darkest tone of Zelda game that we've ever seen. Mm-hmm. Um, and if you haven't played through it, it's amazing and dreadful and one of the best Zelda games of all time. But if you could take that sort of tone to the world, but hand it to Bethesda and have them make this giant epic of a game where where you could spend 200 hours in the universe and never get bored, what would that look like? That would be cool. That would be really cool. I would love to see it. So they, and, they, and there's already some parallels between the like the Elder Scrolls games and the Zelda games anyway. Yeah. Well, because Zelda, honestly, I mean, I'm using air quotes for those who are not going to be able to see, but they were open world when they did the whole Ocarina of Time thing. I mean, it was open world, but it was just, it's a different concept at that point compared to what that means now. Mm -hmm. Right. Nintendo, the older style, the Zelda style of open world game isn't, isn't the Grand Theft Auto or Skyrim style of open world. Yeah. And I really think Breath of the Wild is going to take them into that. I mean, I've watched some of the gameplay footage where they've been playing around. You literally can just do what you want. And I uh, can't remember who was narr- or, uh, translating and everything in this, but they were 
on this cliffside. And he's like, you see those mountains all the way out there? Like, yeah, he's like, you can run all the way to them. Oh, wow. And it's like, that is something that's fantastic. It's something you've never really been able to do for in Zelda. I mean, you've been able to, oh, there's that mountain all the way over there. I'm going to run through this channel and it's going to load up this next screen that's going to be three quarters of the way yeah. there. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah, they, they've That'd done tricks like that. I'm, I'm hoping for the best for Breath of the Wild, but I think so someone a developer with experience could do this a little better and it really pains me to say that about nintendo yeah you hinted at something i think actually could be kind of fun if rockstar was to take on skyrim because you're talking about the two open world behemoths if oh if if they could impart their their quirky humor from the grand theft auto series into Skyrim. the Skyrim world in actually have a well polished game. Mm-hmm. <laughs> that would be that would be a lot of fun. That would be really cool. I mean, you can keep most of the feel there, make it the quirky, funny, silly GTA yeah. shit, but have uh-huh. it be the silky smooth rock star mechanics rather right. than the clunky. The two open world developer behemoths coming together to bring you the the most excellent experience you've ever had. You will never leave this open world, and you will be sad when you go back to the real world. I've, I've got an, another weird, kitschy one. Uh, mm-hmm. Just a quick one. Yeah. Uh, I, I want to see Codemasters take Ridge Racer. Right? Ridge Racer's been basically dead for a long time. Codemasters did um, Dirt. They did um, the newer F1 games. Right? They, oh, they, okay. They, yeah, they, they've been doing all the really nice arcade racers. Yeah. Um, that's the other one. It, it wasn't dirt. That's that's their newest one. Grid. Right. It was grid. Oh, I remember yeah. grid when that first came out. That was really good. Yeah. So I was trying to think of one of these earlier, but I couldn't think of, I couldn't think of the game. But I would like to see frictional games take over something. But I can't. I don't know what quite what it is, because they've got they've got amnesia. You know, it was revolutionary in the survival horror. Genre. You know the modern ones. You know it's incredibly creepy, and then they did Soma, which is very story driven. Like in Amnesia, the story was whatever, but the gameplay was incredible. Soma had that gameplay with an excellent philosophical story behind it. I'd love to see them take over something, maybe another horror series, but I don't know what yet. Eternal darkness. Ideas? Eternal darkness. See, my hmm. favorite horror series that I think could be really good for a super dark is like Mm -hmm. a fatal frame because if you get that level of immersion fatal frame, it's just you, there's no weapons, there's no nothing. You got a camera. That's a good one. Yeah. You feel super exposed while you play that game. It's by far one of the scariest horror games I've ever played. Mostly because like even, even in silent Hill, you know, you're, you're not a, you know, buffed out like space Marine or anything, but you've got a lead pipe and you can, you can hit <laughs> stuff with your lead pipe in fatal frame. It's like, uh, well, you got a Kodak. Like, uh, <laughs> thanks. I'm in a haunted Japanese hotel here and I've got a camera. It, it was that really, be, yeah, really disturbing. Yeah, mix Even up. if they just did like a remake of that game, because yeah. I think Japanese horror has some very, very disturbing qualities to it that, a company that's already familiar with horror games could could expound upon i think yeah because that game doesn't i mean it has shock horror to it but it doesn't rely on it mm-hmm. like the five night at freddy's right I mean, those yeah. games are it's fun, not, it's not gimmicky it's not gimmicky it's it's real horror <laughs> but there was this one jump scare moment in one of the fatal frame games where i was in this room and there was nothing here and i was looking around with my camera forever yeah and and I just, I couldn't find anything. There was nothing mm-hmm. here. It was, it was spooky. It, the yeah. environment was kind of creeping me out. But then I, I got into the camera view and I turned around. And as soon as I turned 180, apparently that's the trigger. There uh-huh. was a dead body hanging from the ceiling in Ooh. front of me swinging. And it freaked me out. And I threw the controller and I stopped playing for the day. So, it was so terrifying. I've, I never actually p- played Fatal Frame, but, you know, I've, I'm kind of familiar with it. But is, is that the game that has that there's like a notorious moment of the girl in the little box or something. There's like a box. I'm not familiar. No, oh, what am I, I didn't play about? very much of it. 
I yeah. was I was playing through Fatal Frame Two is what I was playing through, and then I got to the point where I couldn't play it with the lights off in the basement anymore, so I decided to stop playing it because yep. I was I felt too attached to my manhood to be scared that bad. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I did that with Silent Hill too. I decided that was a daytime only game. So I think that's pretty much a wrap on the um, crossover. So with that, I think that's pretty much all we have for this week. Do you guys have anything else you want to throw in there? But uh, if you would like to to throw in your gaming crossover, listeners out there, you can tweet at us or email us or get in contact uh, with us in chat or you know any other way you want to, uh, which you'll hear about here soon. Yeah, and perfect segue, because with that, all these nice suggestions on crossovers, you can get at us at any of the medians stated, which would be by email at fanmail at 72pinconnector.com. You can tweet at us at 72pcpodcast. You can um, find us on YouTube and comment on this stream or this video. The channel is 72pinconnector. You could go to our Twitch page, which is twitch.tv slash 72pinconnector. And I think that's all the ways you can get a hold of us. So until next week, we hope to hear from you guys. Give us some suggestions and game on. See you guys. Hey, everyone. Bye.